Welcome to Tonight Talk. <laughs> Broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas with Rabbi Michael Skillback. Another episode of A Rabbi Cross Examines the New Testament. And earlier today, I thought that's what we were doing. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. I was just thinking, Rabbi, when I put stream, I actually clicked uh, the, the stream first and record as usual. And I looked up <laughs> and I had the wrong screen up and it was, I was staring at me and so I just gave a big old smile. <laughs> <laughs> it set the mood. I think I sniffed too many paint fumes this afternoon. I know that's got to be it, Rabbi. I think you're having too much fun here well, on Tonight Talk. Yes. And you know what? That's a great thing, in my opinion. I love having fun with you guys. And it really oh, is sure. a joy. It really, really is. I'm just uh, over-delighted to be able to uh, participate with you and all these others. To It's just as great. I'm just, this is definitely a dream come true for me, for sure. So... No, thank you, Robert. This is not your day of rest. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is definitely work day one. <laughs> so grateful for that too, actually. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Wow. So how was your uh, how was your afternoon? Did you get uh, a little bit of lunch and some resting? Uh, yeah. I mean, I did a lot of stuff between now and the last time I spoke with you. <laughs> it's like been a whole day, a whole day's worth of activities. Seems like it. Seems <laughs> like it. All right. Well, today we're going to kick off with Acts chapter fifteen. 15. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, I'm serious. Earlier today, I was so thinking. Whenever you said what, that's not what we're doing. I was, I was sitting here thinking, did we already do 15? I wasn't even <laughs> thinking about like what time of day it was. Oh, that was that was definitely a twilight zone moment for me. <laughs> so, well, good. I, actually, I'm glad we're doing 15. This is a, this is a very interesting, uh, definitely an interesting chapter. I'll I'll throw a few messianic spins in there for you. Uh, along the way. Uh oh, that thing. Oh, it's on a loop cycle. What am I doing? I'm clicking all kinds of buttons. I didn't even realize it. Oh, yeah, this is uh, this is good. This is good. It'll be a good episode for today. So, Rabbi, I'll turn it over to you, and I'll okay. follow along as usual. Well, okay. this is, I mean, this is this chapter is famous uh, uh, for many reasons um, in terms of the really the the unfolding of the Jesus movement in terms of how it is now uh, really dealing with. Actually, in this chapter, the first dispute, really, it's the first really major uh, question that comes up in the early, early days of the of the movement. Uh, we're going to see the the question is because over the past few chapters, we we noticed we we saw that um, Paul was going on his missionary journeys throughout Asia Minor to a number of cities. Uh, apparently, he's been successful in. Uh, connecting with uh, Gentiles, which never really happened in the Jesus movement. We know that in the Gospels, Gentiles are out of the picture. Mm -hmm. And even in the, in the early chapters of Acts, there's not a lot going on with Gentiles. And, uh, you know, Paul essentially declares himself to be the apostle to the Gentiles. At one point, we saw, I think back in chapter uh, 14 or 11, I think I'm getting confused now, he has. He's frustrated with the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. He says, "Now look, I'm finished with you guys. I'm going to the Gentiles." And um, so now there's a question. The question is, what do we do with these Gentiles? What's going to happen with them? Um, and so chapter 15 begins by telling us that there were people who came from Judea, apparently from Jerusalem, and they were coming really to to the places where Paul was operating. Um, so they left Israel. Now, it's interesting. Um, why is it that they left Israel, you know, to come in and, uh, you know, t tell Paul what he should be doing? Because what, what they were teaching uh, these people coming from Jerusalem was that, look, Paul, your converts, your Gentile converts, you know, if they really want to join our movement, our messianic movement following Jesus, they're going to have to get circumcised and uh, follow all the commandments of the Torah. Now, that's basically code for convert to Judaism, meaning that uh, the definition of conversion to Judaism is the need for a Gentile uh, to accept upon himself all the commandments of the Torah, including, of course, the most symbolic one would be for men, circumcision. Um, and so the question is, why are these people coming? You know, why are they schlepping all the way out to uh, wherever Paul is is teaching now? 
Um, and I think it's possible, uh, again, I can't prove this, that they came to check up on Paul. I think that we're going to see, especially when we get to Paul's letters, um, Galatians, that, um, you know, there were people that were, that were um, stalking him. There were people that were following him. There were people from Jerusalem that, you know, that were suspicious of him. Mm-hmm. Um, and there, you know, we're going to see that the major conflict really was over the question of the Torah, the law, the commandments. Now, chronologically speaking, which of which of Paul's letters uh, were first, and which ones kind of ended up in the tail end? Well, we know that First Thessalonians was the first letter. Okay. And uh, now that's being written about the year fifty-five, approximately. Now, Acts that we're reading now, we know was written by Luke, and the the scholarly opinion is that this is being composed in about the 80s, 90s. So it's at the tail end, right? Well, I mean, Paul's letters were already done in the 60s, I mean, because he okay. was himself killed. Um, I don't think he lived, you know, uh, into the into the 70s at all. I think he was in... in um, okay. Some sometime in that sixth decade of the first century, um, Paul died already. So Paul's already long gone. Interestingly enough, uh, probably about twenty years at least mm-hmm. um, by the time this book of Acts is being written. Which is, it's again, it's sort of a little bit confusing because you know this is a, a history that's being written looking backwards at stories that already happened, and of course Paul's letters that really deal with the same topic or written much earlier and and that's why they're important they're important for two reasons number one because they were written more at the time that the stories took place and number two they're written by Paul himself now this account that we're reading here in Acts is written not by Paul it's written about Paul right Mm -hmm. by Luke and it's written a long time after the stories happened and so, you know, if we're going to choose, you know, which one is probably more accurate in terms of what was going on. It would be the ones know, that he wrote. Yeah, you would yeah. imagine. Uh, and so, um, you know, here you have this, I think it must have been a group of people that were coming to Paul's ministry uh, in the diaspora because there were, as we're going to see later on in the book of Acts, there were rumors that were hounding Paul. People were hearing already back in Judea that there were issues with Paul. And again, the main issue um, is going to be over the question of the role of the Torah, the commandments, um, and there was a lot of suspicion about him. You know, I'd like to insert a thought um, on this uh, Acts 15 verse, uh, uh, the verse 1, where it says, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Um, you know, there is circumcision is in the Torah, obviously, uh, but the circumcision after the manner of Moses is not in the Torah, it's in the oral Torah. That's where he describes how one must be circumcised after the manner of Moses. And so part of me thinks that this right here is just another uh, pointer, really maybe even suggesting that Paul may have been, well, first Karaite, if you will, <laughs> you know, someone who really disregards the oral Torah altogether. Um, and it's like, um, because it seemed like they was discussing two issues here, uh, one, uh, one being circumcised and the second one on how it was being circumcised. So it's, it's an interesting point you're making, uh, you know, to distinguish between circumcision and circumcision according to the custom of Moses. Um, because what's interesting is that, uh, you know, the, the classical Christian understanding of the oral law was that it wasn't from Moses, right? right? The, the classical understanding is that, you know, anything taught by Moses is from God. That was the revelation of God. And, you know, what the oral law was, again, according to the way most Christians understand it, are the traditions of the rabbis that are not coming from Moses. Um, now, that's not accurate from, uh, from a Jewish point of view. From a Jewish point of view, the oral Torah is from Moses right. just as much as the written Torah is. So you're raising an interesting point, and whether you can distinguish between circumcision, um, which pr- maybe Paul 
you know, was was uh, accepting here for the Gentiles, and the only problem that he had was with the uh, oral law way of doing it. Um, I, I'm not reading it that way. I mean, but I, I, I think it's an interesting proposal. I, I think that what it means here is that, um, you know, we know later on that these people are Pharisees who were the uh, bearers of the oral Torah. So from their point of view, uh, you know, Moses taught the oral law as well. And what they're saying is that these Gentiles, and, and it actually it becomes clearer uh, if you just jump down for a minute to verse 5, um, where it says that some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, right, they believed in Jesus as the Messiah, rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them, right, and to command them to keep the Torah of Moses. So I think that, that you know, what it's referring to here is simply the observance of the Torah um, and to get circumcised. And since these are Pharisees, right, it would be keeping the Torah as understood by both the written and oral Torah. Right, and right. Exactly. To circumcise according, because you're right, in the written Torah itself, there aren't really any uh, instructions about what even circumcision is. Right? Right. If you just have the written text of the Torah, you wouldn't even know what part of the body circumcision is done. <laughs> You'd be listen, missing an earlobe or a skin <laughs> of the elbow. <laughs> <laughs> Take off your little tip of your elbow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, it, it seems to me that what's going on is that Paul was not, uh, you know, requiring any circumcision uh, from the Gentiles, and he wasn't uh, requiring that people keep any of the laws of Moses. And these people are coming, and they're saying, "Look, you know, um, you know, they're they're basically saying, look, these are non-Jews, and if they want to join our movement of people who are following the Messiah, they have to become Jews, just like we do, and live that, just like we are, and that's going to be happening through conversion, which would be through circumcision and the performance of all the commandments. So I think that what they're arguing for here." is that the Gentiles that Paul is reaching out to, they have to be converted to Judaism. And, uh, and that became a question. You know, is that, is that necessary? Uh, is that required for Gentiles coming into the movement? And so uh, in verse 2, we're told that when Paul and Barnabas um, had no small dissension and dispute with them, meaning it's saying that apparently that Paul and Barnabas argued with them. They didn't accept this this idea that the Gentiles have to convert to Judaism. So these people who came from Judea determined that Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Now it's interesting that it seems like what happened is these people from Jerusalem and it seems they were Pharisees who were followers of Jesus were insisting that the Gentiles get become converted to Judaism and observe all the laws of the Torah. Paul and Barnabas were saying no. Now, we don't know what their position was. It just says that they disputed with them. And then it seems that what's happening is that this group that came from Jerusalem, they decided that, look, Paul and Barnabas, you're going to have to come back with us to Jerusalem. Um, so it sounds like they're really being summoned to go back to Jerusalem. It doesn't sound like Paul himself is so interested in doing this. Um, and we know why. You know, we'll, we know this from later on, that Paul did not really see himself as um, answerable to the apostles in Jerusalem. You know, he basically looked down upon them, and he felt that he had authority from Jesus directly to be the apostle to the Gentiles, and he didn't need to speak to anyone else. So we know that Paul was not really interested in going to Jerusalem. So he was basically a self-appointed rabbi. <laughs> well, I think I'll that's what that, happened. Yeah. He, you know, uh, he claims that Jesus appointed him, but if we don't accept his claim that Jesus came and spoke to him, it would be he himself that, you know, assumed this role. And what happens, interestingly, in the book of Galatians, and we're not going to, I'm not going to do too much comparison tonight because it would take us forever, but in the second chapter of Galatians, where Paul seems to tell this story on his own, um, he doesn't say that he was summoned 
you know, or, or he was told by others that he has to go to Jerusalem. Paul in, in Galatians chapter 2 says that it was God who told him to go to Jerusalem. That it was, that, I mean, probably what he means is that uh, from his point of view that it was Jesus who told him and that means God told him. So we have a little bit, of, not a little bit, we're going to see there's a massive discrepancies between uh, Galatians chapter 2 and this chapter here in, in mm -hmm. Acts. But I'm going to try to stick to Acts today at least. Um, so that's what happens. So, so Barnabas and Paul are essentially told, look, you've got to come back with us to Jerusalem. And uh, that's what they do. They, they are now going to get a ruling from the Jerusalem council um, about what, what the deal is. I mean, what do we do with these Gentiles? It's not clear to me, by the way, just uh, I want to go back for a minute. When these people came from Judea and said that unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. I'm, I'm not really clear exactly what it means to be saved. I mean, what are they referring to? Um, you know, it sounds like a borrowed phrase because, you know, in, in normative Judaism, we don't talk about, you know, being saved in, in some kind of spiritual way. I mean, you know, the only way that word is really used in Scripture is that if you're being attacked by enemies, you know, you're going to mm, be rescued right, physically. Right. Um, and it sounds here like they're using the word saved in the way that Paul will use it, which is that, you know, you have a spiritual death sentence uh, of eternal damnation that you know you're going to suffer unless you come to faith in Jesus. So it sounds like that you know they're using this expression you cannot be saved as uh, you know sort of eternal life and to have right, uh, right. share in the world to come. And so the, the word is a little bit odd. And um what happens now the, the, I guess the key um the key thing to bear in mind and I'll, I'll get back to this a few times is that well, I think I'll just point it out now. I think one of the reasons this chapter uh, is important, is significant, uh, one of the reasons is that it's. I think it's really pretty strong evidence that the disciples of Jesus, the apostles, meaning the original followers of Jesus who are now based in Jerusalem, that they were Torah observant. That's the, th that's the uh, issue that I think we can safely walk away with from this chapter and it's an important uh, piece of information meaning that we saw back in Acts chapter 5 with the whole trial of Peter and the others in front of Gamliel that it seemed pretty clear from that story that Peter and the others were Torah observant otherwise Gamliel would not have said leave them alone they're doing nothing wrong it seemed mm -hmm. from that story that the followers of Jesus in Jerusalem were Torah observant and again it shouldn't come as a surprise because essentially everything out of Jesus' mouth was that they should be keeping the commandments. And so this chapter also is another, I believe, proof that the, the, the apostles and the, the Jesus movement that was based in Jerusalem were Torah observant because if they weren't, there'd be no one suggesting that Gentiles coming into the movement would have to begin observing the commandments of the Torah. Um, you know, it wouldn't be a, a question or it wouldn't even be a suggestion that we're going to require Gentiles to keep the Torah unless the Jews themselves were observing the Torah. Um, so I think that it's very clear from this chapter, whatever decision they're going to come up with in terms of policy for Gentiles coming into the movement, it's very, very clear that what's not said, what what the, the leaders of the movement don't say in this chapter is that really no one has to keep the Torah. The only question about observing the Torah is for Gentiles. And it seems that the requirement of Torah observance for Jews is taken for granted. That's not even a question. Um, so now in verse 6, they, they get together. In Jerusalem, the apostles and the elders come together to consider this matter because this was a bit of a controversy. And when there had been much dispute, I guess there was a lot of back and forth, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know, we're in verse 7 now, that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Believe. 
Um, it's interesting that, you know, Peter here doesn't make any reference to the Great Commission. It sounds like, um, you know, Peter is almost saying that this idea of going to the Gentiles was something that was sort of originated with him and that he was given some kind of a private revelation. But again, they don't seem to be aware of the fact that in Matthew 28, Jesus had already given, allegedly, now I, I mentioned last week, I believe, that I don't personally believe Jesus gave this Great Commission. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I think this is another proof for that, 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 that Peter doesn't seem to have any knowledge of it and doesn't mention it. But think, Peter says that, that, you know, that we were chosen, we were, that God chose us among, the, uh, among us that the uh, that through my mouth, Peter says, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. I think and he goes if, on and says, "Excuse me." I think if Jesus did uh, actually produce that great commission, that would have been even a much more resistance from the Jews to even accept it because of Jeremiah. How was that? Well, I mean, you know, the prophecy that well, I think it was in Jeremiah uh, says, you know, that the, the the new covenant was for the house of Israel and Judah, or however that's worded. Um, and so if Jesus came preaching, it's not just for you guys, but now it's also for all of the nations also. That's just a direct violation of the prophets that they would have already known about. Um, possibly. I mean, it's a good point you're making. I mean, you could, uh, you know, say that, you know, that um, Jeremiah, you know, is the new covenant of putting the Torah into the hearts of Israel and Judah is limited to uh, the people of Israel and Judah, but the, the the ramifications of that, because we know that through the scriptures, there's going to be an impact, you know, in the messianic age on the Gentiles as well. So it's not as if the Gentiles don't have any role or significance in the Tanakh in terms of God's ultimate plans. So I'm not sure that Jeremiah 31 there would be a knockout punch. Um, you know, if Jesus did say that, look, we have a mandate to teach the Gentiles, <laughs> because that's, again, part of the, you know, God's, uh, you know, message to us is we're supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, a light into the nations. Right, right. Um, so, I, I mean, but I, I agree with you that it could be argued, that point. Um, but I, I, again, I'm just su su suggesting that this idea of a great commission probably comes up only later, and it didn't really come from Jesus. Got it. And Peter here um, sort of ignores that, and he goes on in verse 8 and says, So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, Peter argues, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, meaning the Gentile disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus, we will be saved in the same manner as they. Now, this is a real mouthful, <laughs> this, this speech by Peter. Um, it seems pretty clear, at least to me, that uh, if, you, if you take this speech in a certain way, at least in the way it seems to be understood on, on its simplest level, it seems to be totally out of character for Peter and totally out of character for the Jerusalem apostles. I mean, it seems to be something that um, Peter would never have said. It seems very, very out of character. And it, it really seems to be the kind of speech that was retrofit back into the mouth of Peter uh, later on by the author of Acts. Um, it's just a very, very strange hmm. speech that he's giving here, and I'll try to analyze it. First of all, um, to say that God made no distinction between the Gentiles and the Jews is just absurd. Um, you know, the, the scripture is very clear. Uh, if you go to a, a passage like Psalm chapter 147, it speaks very clearly at the very end, the last two verses, that you know the, there's a there's a huge distinction between Israel, who was given the Torah to observe, and the Gentile nations, who were not given the Torah to observe, and um, you know there are gazillion laws in the Bible 
that do distinguish between Jews and Gentiles. For example, the prohibition against intermarriage, about marrying Gentiles, etc. So to say that, that God didn't make any distinction between us and them is a bit of a problem. Um, because it's a very, very absolute statement that God made no distinction. I mean, if it would have said here he didn't, he made he made some distinctions, that would be more tolerable. But to say that he didn't make any distinctions is problematic. And then he goes on to say that that why would we require the Gentiles to observe the Torah? Because that would be putting a yoke on the neck of these Gentile disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Now, it seems that what he's saying is that it's impossible to keep the Torah. Now, were the disciples Gentiles? I thought they were all Jewish. Well, I think that he's using the word disciples here oh, to general... refer to the, the Gentile disciples that they're arguing about. Okay, got because it. He's, because he's, that's the question. He's saying, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples? Meaning, that's what, you're, that's what you guys who are arguing that the, that the Gentiles should be circumcised and observing the commandments... That's what you're arguing, Paul, uh, Peter says here. You're, you're testing God by wanting to put a yoke on these disciples. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming he's referring to the Gentile disciples that Paul is bringing in. Why do you want to make them do something, Peter here says, which neither our fathers nor we? So he's distinguishing between we, right, the Jewish followers of Jesus, and the other disciples, which are the Gentiles. And Peter is saying that it's impossible for us to keep the Torah, so why impose it on the Gentiles? Right. Huh. And the problem there, you know, is again back to Deuteronomy chapter 30, where God weighs in on this question, and God says it's not too difficult to keep the Torah. So what do you mean? What is Peter saying here all of a sudden that it's impossible to keep the Torah? Um, very, very problematic. And uh, to basically say that. Um, now there's no distinction between Jews and Gentiles and essentially seeming to say that we believe in verse 11 he says here that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved in the name in the same manner as they meaning that he seems to be saying that salvation will come through believing in Jesus and not through the observance of the Torah now the problem is that this is pure 100 percent Pauline doctrine, meaning that the, the, the two things that Paul will be teaching in the letters when we get to his letters are that, number one, the distinction between Jews and Gentiles will be, has been broken down. Right? Paul says is neither Greek nor Jew. They're, we're all now one on the, in the body of Christ. Or when um, Paul says that the middle wall of partition has been broken down between Jews and Gentiles, I mean, it's one of the major themes. Paul speaks about one new man. There's going to be one new man, not like you know the old world order where there were differences between people. Paul has this idea that you know, with the coming of Jesus, the distinctions between Jews and Gentiles basically evaporate. Um, that he even secondly, goes into Romans, real fast into Romans. He even goes as far as to say. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum. I think this is why Paul is so hard to understand is because he says one thing in Galatians and he says one thing in Acts, but then over, like I said, in Romans, he says something completely polar opposite. He says, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Well, that would be both Jews and Gentiles, though, right? That That's right. A, 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 there, but there you're right. He seems to be arguing that it's important to keep a Torah there. Right, right, um, and it's true. By the way, Paul's writings are a jumble of contradictions, uh, and and we're going to have to struggle with that, right? Right. right. But I, I would say personally that you know you have to really, and this is just my personal feeling. You have to understand Paul through the spectrum of both his writings and the way his writings were understood by those who followed him and by his opponents, meaning, um, you know, you read the writings of Paul and people have made all kinds of uh, assessments that Paul was not against the observing of the Torah, he was against the observing of the Torah, he was pro-Torah, he was anti-Torah. It seems pretty clear to me that Paul came to reject the binding nature of the commandments, whether People would be under liberty to follow the commandments if they wanted to, you know, it was up for grabs. But it seems to me 
that Paul did not believe that the the observing of the Torah was a requirement, an absolute requirement for neither Jews nor Gentiles. And I say this for a number of reasons. Number one, it's very clear that the emerging church that came out of his writings did not believe that there was any obligation to observe the commandments. And we know that centuries began to persecute the Jewish followers of Jesus who kept on keeping the commandments. So it's very clear that those people who read Paul, meaning the Gentile church that emerged, they did not believe that Paul had any uh, requirement that anyone observe the Torah. It's, so it's clear from the behavior of the church and their policy toward those believers in Jesus who did want to keep the Torah. It's also clear from, and we're going to see this in Acts, that, you know, that the Jerusalem church was suspicious of him precisely for this issue. We'll see in, in chapter 21, he's accused right to his face. Look, Paul, we're hearing these ugly rumors about you that you're teaching people not to keep the Torah. So it's an accusation made against him. Um, it seems to be very clearly the policy of um, you know, his followers, his Gentile followers. And we know that in the second century, we have the writings about the Ebionites and the Nazareans, and we know that they considered Paul to be a heretic because he rejected the Torah. So p people do wow. try to make the argument that Paul was Torah observant and he didn't reject the observance of the Torah. I think it's, it's a hard case to make, although I, I understand that you know, the case is made. Uh, it's just something that I don't see. I think we're going to see in, in verse 19 and 20 of this very chapter, you're going to see more that does make it look like he's Torah observant. And he's teaching that even the Gentiles have to do so as well as you go along. Um, like I said, what, once you get to 19 and 20, I'll kind of point out a few little thoughts I have for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to revive the, this, the great dispute in, in Acts 15 now. One thing I really think I learned about, about Paul all, all, all this time so far, though, is he's very, very much anti-pro anything. <laughs> he's anti-pro. He's anti-pro. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting that, you know, here you have, uh, we're not really discussing Paul here. This is a speech that Peter is making. And what I've been trying to say is that this speech by Peter sounds like it was written by Paul. And... Um, it seems that what's going on in this little piece here between verses 6 and 11 is that um, Peter is being used in a way that really is typical of the whole book of Acts. Um, you know, people have suggested, and I think there's a lot of merit to this idea, that the agenda of Luke in writing the book of Acts is to try to bridge the gap between Paul and the group in Jerusalem because the truth is and we're going to see this in the letters of Paul there was uh, you know friction there was a lot of friction between the followers of Jesus based in Jerusalem and Paul based in diaspora they did not get along and they they were not on the same page and that created a problem for Paul because it seemed as if there was no continuity between Jesus and the Apostles and Paul it seemed that Paul was basically starting his own religion and had very little connection to what originally uh, was taking place uh, around Jesus and his followers. And so the agenda of the, the writer of Acts is to really try to smooth over, over these differences and create the impression that really they're all one happy family, that they're all on the same team, and Paul and Peter and James, they're basically working together and they have this, you know, little question that comes up here, and they come up with a solution, and now everybody's on the same page. And so some commentaries have pointed out that, um, you know, that's what seems to have happened to Peter here. Peter seems to have basically gone off script in terms of his own beliefs, um, because it, these, are, these are sentiments that Peter is expressing that are just totally out of character. Peter did not believe that 
that there was no more distinction at this point between Jews and Gentiles. Peter did not believe at this point that salvation is, you know, simply through believing in Jesus and not through observing the Torah. But it seems that this is what he's saying in this speech. And so there were those who suggested that Peter never said this, but the author of Acts is putting these words into Peter's mouth to use him again uh, for the purpose of giving the impression that Peter and Paul are on the same page. As a matter of fact, in church tradition, right, we know this, they try to always portray Peter and Paul as attached at the hip, right? right? Meaning mm -hmm. that they're, um, part, they're brothers in faith. You know, you have in, in Rome, right, the, 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 the church that has the two statues of Peter and Paul, and they're just, they're, you know, I, I remember in the, the Lord of the Flies, you had Sam and Eric, the two twins, uh, the, or the two brothers, they were always said in one breath, Sam and Eric, Sam and Eric. So it's always Peter and Paul, Peter and Paul, Peter and Paul, as if Peter and Paul are the, the closest colleagues in the world. And that tradition that the church developed was for a purpose, meaning that the, it would look ugly if Peter was at complete odds with Paul, because it would seem as if Paul is now breaking away and starting his own movement. And so there's, there's this concerted effort to try and, and make it seem as if Peter and Paul are on the same team. And we know, unfortunately, that's not, not, not the case. We know that, and we'll see it in, in Paul's own writings, that he was a bitter opponent of Peter. They were not on the same page. They did not get along. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a very weird speech here that anyone studying this chapter has to sort of be sensitive to the fact that what Peter is saying here um, is just, um, you know, totally out of character. And he seems to be giving a speech that Paul could have written, um, again, not in the book of Acts. Paul wouldn't say these things in Acts. Um, you know, these kind of sentiments that the law is done away with and the distinction between Jews and Gentiles done away with, those only come out in Paul's letters. You know, here again, the whole agenda is to make it seem as if Paul and the Jerusalem Council are all one happy family. Um, and then in verse 12, all the people there kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. So now they're you know, able to tell the good news to the, the council that they've been very successful. And after they had become silent, now meaning that the group there, they, the, everyone quieted down. Now James answered. So you had, again, the, the sort of the, the, the troublemakers who were saying, look, these people that Paul is reaching out to, they have to observe all the commandments and they have to get circumcised. And Peter gives this incredibly weird speech, which seems to be saying, that you know, there's no more di there's no more distinction between Jews and Gentiles, mm -hmm. and you know we'll all be saved in the same way, which is through faith in Jesus. James doesn't seem to have any, uh, maybe didn't even hear this speech by Peter. It seems as if, from James' point of view, you know this whole speech that Peter allegedly made, he didn't make. It's like he just went uh, one ear and out the other, or he exactly. didn't catch it all. Yeah, it's like right. it's like because if I think if James heard this speech, he would have been upside his head. You know, <laughs> he what kind of speech is that? Mm -hmm. um, so it seems as if you know James at this point is going to speak, and you know that's why I get the impression that those sentences that Peter is is saying he didn't say those sentences, and someone just airbrushed them in later on. You know, again using Peter. As, as this, you know, device, a literary device, you know, to make it sound as if Peter, who is this great apostle, he's the same as Paul. So James here says in verse 13, men and brethren, listen to me, right? Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it's written. And now, um, Acts chapter 15 is apparently quoting from the book of Amos, the prophet Amos, chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Although I will rebuild its ruins, I will set it up. That's how Acts quotes from the book of Amos. The actual verse in Amos, I'll read now. It says, On that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David, Sukkot David, 
I will repair their breaches, and its ruins I will raise up, and I'll build it up as in days of old. So it's, hmm, it's you sort can of certainly similar. see the connection, right? It's similar, but right. not the same. Right. And then in verse 17, uh, Acts goes on to say, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. So in, A in Amos chapter 9, verse 12, it says, so that they upon whom my name is called shall inherit the remnant of Edom, and all the nations, declares Hashem, who shall do this. So again, it is a very, very uh, tenuous connection between the actual verses in Amos and the way James is allegedly quoting them here in Acts. Um, the point is that what James seems to be saying is that this uh, movement among the Gentiles, you know, to accept the gospel... James seems to be saying that this was prophesied in the prophet Amos. Now, what Amos is actually speaking about is very clearly not taking place here, because Amos is speaking about uh, the complete restoration of the kingdom of David. Um, some people even understand the, the booth of David, Sukkot David, to be the rebuilding of the temple mm -hmm. that was destroyed. Now, <laughs> this chapter in the book of Acts you know, is being written, you know, about 10 to 15 years after the temple's been destroyed, not after the temple's <laughs> been built. Right. And the, the the Jewish sovereignty, I mean, this is after the destruction of Jerusalem. You know, the book of Amos is speaking about the restoration of Israel, possibly, you know, including the return of the ten lost tribes. But, you know, the book of Amos is speaking about um, if you look at the verses prior to verses 11 and 12, it speaks about how the nation is going to undergo tremendous uh, tribulation, exile. They're going to be, you know, the, the people are going to suffer tremendously. So that's the, the, the prior prediction in the book of Amos, that the people of Israel are going to really go through horrible times. But then in verses 11 and 12, it's a messianic prophecy. It's speaking mm -hmm. about the uh, restoration of the kingdom of Israel, the, the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, and that um, in verse 12, what it seems to be saying is that when the messianic kingdom is here, so the nations of the world will come to recognize the truth about God. And that's the fulfillment we see in, in Isaiah chapter 60 of the nations coming to Israel's light and Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23, about 10 people from every nation of the world grabbing the whole hold of a Jewish person's garment and saying, I want to follow you, we've heard God is with you. And in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, in that day God will be one and his name will be one. That This is an actual messianic prophecy, which clearly didn't happen 2,000 years ago. Um, you know, the fact that you had, you know, uh, a small number of Gentiles that became followers of Jesus did not mean that at that time the whole world came to embrace God as the true God. Um, so it's very clear that Amos chapter 9 has certainly not happened yet in history. As a matter of fact, in terms of the dating of the book of Acts, it was the exact opposite. It wasn't the restoration of the kingdom. It was right after the destruction mm, of the kingdom. Interesting. Um, so James basically gives that as a preamble to his speech. And then he says in verse 18, this is sort of the punchline, Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge. Now, this is very interesting, by the way. What is, what is it happening? How is it happening now that James is giving the ruling? Who is James? We mm -hmm. know that James wasn't one of the original 12 apostles. And was that not the James, the brother of Jesus? It was, but he wasn't okay. one of the original 11, uh, 12 apostles. Okay. Right? He came, uh, he came on the scene later on, allegedly after the resurrection of Jesus. So while Jesus was alive, we know that his brothers were not following him. And so James, it's correct, is the brother of Jesus here. This is the brother of Jesus. And what's strange is that, you know, it's he who is making the ruling, right? He's, one, he's the one that's making the ruling. And we know from historical sources that it was James that was the leader of the group in Jerusalem until he himself was killed around the year 62. Hmm. So for about 30 years, it was James who led the Jesus movement, not Peter and not John. And 
it's it's probably because you know it seems at least that they saw the Jesus line as a um, a as a um, a royal line, so to speak. If Jesus was seen as the king, so the next in line would have been his brother James, mm. and so it, that's the only reason why they would have appointed James the leader, because James certainly, you know, was not a follower of Jesus during uh, Jesus' ministry. So James here rules in verse 19. I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. Now, before we get to this, I, I just I, I apologize, but I wanted to go back uh, and just mention something from earlier because I, I forgot to... to um, to mention this, I think it's important. Um, back in Peter's speech, where Peter says that neither us or our fathers were able to observe the Torah, um, you know, it, it seems impossible to understand. I hope I'm not confusing people by jumping back now, but um, I just wanted to make sure we nail this down. That when Peter makes this speech, and I don't think he did, but whoever's making the speech, when they say that you know why would you want to require the Gentiles to observe the Torah this is back in verse 10 right why would you want to make the Gentiles keep the Torah when neither we or our fathers were able to that's a very strange thing to say because it, it seems to imply that it was impossible to keep the Torah and there are two problems with that number one God says in Deuteronomy 30 that you can keep the Torah it's not too difficult and number two if it was impossible to keep the Torah why would God give it and threaten dire punishments if they don't give it, but they don't keep it. <laughs> right. And it's, it's impossible to understand that. So David Stern, in his commentary, um, suggests something which I think is just not plausible. He says that, of course, he believes Peter was not rejecting the observance of the Torah. He believes that Peter was Torah observant and that Jews who follow Jesus should be Torah observant. He says that what the, the criticism here was not against the Torah, but it was against the rabbinic fences that were established by the rabbis to protect the Torah. The oral law. And this sort of, you know, th th these burdens, these heavy burdens of rabbinic fences and extensions of the law. Now, and that's how David Stern understands this, that that's the only thing that Peter was criticizing, that that's what's too difficult. The problem is that it doesn't really square with the language here because the language is, you know, the proposal was to make these uh, Gentiles observe the laws of Moses. It doesn't say to observe the, uh, you know, fences of the rabbis. So it just, to me, doesn't work out with the, the language of the passage. If I wanted to be generous and I wanted to... This is my commentary when I write my commentary to the New Testament... <laughs> Um, I think what Peter might be meaning is this. Not that it's impossible to keep the commandments. Obviously, it's possible. But what Peter might be saying is this. He might be saying that, look, the Gentiles were never under an obligation to observe the commandments. We know as Jews that it's, a, it's difficult. It's a yoke. It's, it's, a, it's not easy to observe the commandments. And when he says that it's a yoke that we can't bear, he doesn't mean that we're not able to keep them. I think that it means that it's difficult to keep them. And and we do make mistakes, and we have to obviously repent of those mistakes that we make. I don't think the argument he's making is that it's impossible, as many Christians say, to keep the law. I think what he's saying is, look, we have enough difficulty with it. It's very hard. So if it's hard for us and it's, it's not so easy for us to keep and for our fathers to have kept. We know how many mistakes we all made. Um, why would we want to impose it on the Gentiles when they're under no real obligation to keep it anyway? So I think that's what it might mean. It may not be a full-blown attack on the ability to observe the Torah. Okay. I just wanted to get that in. So back to James. So James says that we're not going to trouble those among the Gentiles in verse 19 here who are turning to God, we're not going to require that they get circumcised 
and observe all the commandments of the Torah, but, in verse 20, that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. Are those, and, are those Noahide laws? Or so are those... That's, that's the $64,000 question. Because my first uh, thought was that all these things were laws that are actually encoded in the Torah. You know, so, you know, not... Uh, but then again, you know, I've heard Rabbi Singer say that, you know, that having, um, you know, impure uh, relationships is, is a violation of the Noahide laws. Eating the blood from, you know, a live animal is, is a violation of Noahide laws. So it seems like, at first glance, I was thinking that this was all he was saying, just make sure they follow the Noahide law. I mean, no, I'm sorry. My first glance was it seemed like he, he was enforcing the Torah by saying this, saying, you know, um, Wherefore the sentence is this: We don't trouble them from the uh, among the Gentiles, who who are who are turning to God or turn turning to them. And they're in the process of approaching God, but to start them off with the things that are problematic now, which are these four things, because verse twenty one has a a connection point that almost brings a different light of context in the whole uh, three verse passage, if you want to call it. You're right. Verse twenty one is. Uh is a huge problem. No one in the world understands it. Um, I think David Stern in his commentary gives six or seven different possibilities of what it means. None of the Christian commentaries understands verse 21. It's simply just not clear what he means. I think it's part of uh, why the Messianic movement has, has taken such flight because if you look at it from, a, from from the way the Messianics teach it, it makes it makes perfect sense. But you have to see the entire New Testament the way they do for this to make sense. And that is... Again, going back to 19 and 20, where he's he's saying these four things, which just so happen to be in the law, uh, where he's, you know, so he's not telling them they will have to keep the law. They actually do because three of the four things he mentioned were dietary laws. Um, but then in verse 21, he says, because Moses in old time have never ever sinned, them that preach him being read in the synagogue every Sabbath day, referring to the Gentiles learning from the law of Moses regularly. So he's saying, don't let, don't force them to do all this stuff now. That would be a burden. Just have them do the main things. You know, stop celebrating Christmas and Easter. You know, stop eating ham and pig meat. Uh, you know, because those are in America, that's our our big clutches here. You know, and it says and, and just let them learn it gradually as they go to the synagogues every Sabbath day, because that's where they teach the law of Moses, and they'll learn this on their own. So it seemed like the burden may have been uh, that learning the entire Torah all at once or being forced to keep the entire Torah all at once would have been a burden, a yoke or an anchor that could have actually drowned them, so to speak. It's a, I know I, I never considered that possibility. That So what you're saying is that the beginning of the chapter, there are those people who are saying, look, these guys have to convert, and that would mean that right now they have to observe all the commandments and they have to get circumcised. Right. And you're saying that it would be too difficult, too much of a burden. So you're saying that James is saying, no, they don't have to do everything now. We're going to sort of uh, slowly break them in by beginning with these particular laws. And that uh, the implication is that they're going to have to, down the road, fully convert to Judaism by getting circumcised and uh, observing all the rest of the laws of the Torah. Right. Uh, interesting. I, I don't see it that way, although, you know, <laughs> right. we, we can agree to disagree. Most people don't. <laughs> I, I, I think that um, I, I would go with the understanding um, for a number of reasons that um, James is not um, accepting the idea that Gentiles have to ultimately keep all the commandments and get circumcised. And it, it seems that because it's, it, it, you have here a list of commandments, like for example, if we were going to say, you know, let's get the Gentiles started, um, you know, let's choose some, uh, well, it's, it's, I guess it wouldn't be totally unreasonable. These are basically um, a short version of the seven Noahide laws. And I think that you could actually find six of them out of the seven here. Let me let me go through them just to okay, cool. um, clarify for the listeners and the viewers. First, when he says that 
we're going to say that they have to abstain from things polluted by idols. So uh, what it means, very clearly what it means is that um, we want them to stay away from anything um, because it doesn't speak about food here. Mm, um, right, that's a good It's really point. more general that anything that has been touched by idolatry, we want them to keep away from idolatry. Nice. Now, that's one of the Noahide laws for sure. And it could be, we know that another one of the Noahide laws is the prohibition against blasphemy. Now, blasphemy is not mentioned here by James, but it could be that because blasphemy is very um, similar to idolatry, that he may have sort of included it, although, again, I'm speculating there. Um, so he may not have listed uh, blasphemy at all, or it may be sort of understood because it's so similar to idolatry that that's included. Then he says fornication, which is another one of the seven Noahide laws. That's the prohibition against you know, improper sexual relationships. Um, it's referred to in Hebrew as gilu yarayot. And then he mentions... Um, things strangled. Now, that is not clear what it's referring to. I mean, is that um, not the oral law on Kashrut, or as far as um, um, proper slaughtering of animal? And, yeah, it, right? it could be that it's that it's speaking about, um, you know, something to do with killing an animal properly. You know, it seems that it's a very complicated. Um, entry on this list that if you go to Genesis chapter 9 verses 3 to 5 it speaks about um, you know not consuming um, uh, you know uh, certain ways of not consuming uh, animals uh, let me just bring up the passage here I've got it up here um, also so in Genesis 9 What God says to Noah after they um, after the flood, he says, "Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you." Previously to this, human beings were not allowed to eat uh, meat. Right in the Garden of Eden, they were only allowed to eat vegetables and grains and fruits. So now they're given permission to eat everything, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. You're now allowed to eat animals. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. So now for you, animals will be permissible just like the green herbs. But you shall not eat flesh with its life. Meaning that you have to have the animal dead before you eat it. That is its blood. I mean, they have to kill the animal in a way that its blood has all come out. Surely, for your lifeblood, I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast that will require it, and from the hand of every man. Um, so that seems like it would follow the last prohibition of where he says, and from blood. So that, that, that's what I want to get to. I think that when it says, from that which is strangled, I'm just making a, 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 a speculation here, that that an animal that didn't have all its blood drained and was not fully dead was prohibited from being eaten meaning that if you just sort of strangle the animal without killing it fully and you ate it he's, I think it's saying that uh, you can't eat that which is merely strangled you have to actually have it killed by draining out all its blood as it says in Genesis chapter 9 verses 3 to 4 and then right after this because it's a dietary law. In mm -hmm. Genesis 9, it's a dietary law. But then it mentions not killing people, right? In verse 5 and in uh, 6, etc., right? Surely for your lifeblood I'll demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast I'll require it, and from the hand of every man, from the hand of every man's brother, I'll require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Meaning that it's going from a dietary law to the laws of murder in verses 5 and 6. And so I would propose, again, I, 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 I'm far from being able to prove this, that when it lists here as one of the prohibitions from that which is strangled, I would say that corresponds to the Noahide law of eating the limb of a living creature, 
And then when the next one says from blood, it's speaking about murder. Just as in the, the oh. chapter 9 of Genesis, huh. it lists the, the dietary law followed by the prohibition against murder. And Interesting. he doesn't list in here the prohibition of theft, of stealing. That's one of the Noahide laws. But it could be, again, that in the same way that James is sort of wrapping up blasphemy into idolatry, he could be including in the prohibition against murder also the prohibition against robbery. I mean, that it, it could be sort of short form saying killing and robbing. The only one that wouldn't be here on this list at all, any way, shape, form whatsoever, is the positive Noahide law of setting up courts of law. And that wouldn't be long, because here um, James is speaking about what you tell an individual Gentile who's coming to embrace the God of Israel and the belief in Jesus as <laughs> the Messiah. Um, so this is a law, the positive law of setting up courts of law is not imposed upon an individual. That's imposed upon a Gentile community. It's not an individual law. It's a communal law. So if you take out that number seven from the Noahide laws, it seems that the list here that James is giving is either um, three or four out of the remaining six Noahide laws or possibly contains really some allusion to all six Noahide laws. And um, it seems that because of that and just because of the general Jewish idea that in Judaism historically we don't believe that Gentiles ever had to observe the Torah. There'd be no reason for mm -hmm. James to be advocating that here. And what he seems to be saying is, as opposed to you people who are coming in the beginning of the chapter, saying that the Gentiles have to keep the whole Torah and have to get circumcised, James seems to be stepping back and saying, no, it's not necessary. All they need to do is, if they want to become followers of Jesus, if they're Gentiles, is to observe the Noahide laws. And in verse 21, I have no idea what James is saying. Um, he may be, at, in verse 21, saying that, look, that's what the Gentiles will do. And in verse 21, he says, and for us Jews, Moses has been throughout many generations uh, read, you know, we read him every week in the synagogue, every Shabbat, and he's preached, and he's basically, it seems to be a way of saying that, you know, they will go their way by following the Noahide laws, and we, the Jewish community, the, the Jewish believers in Jesus, we have Moses, and that's been our tradition throughout, you know, history, is that we are connected to the Torah that's read in the synagogue every Shabbat. It's sort of possibly maybe what it means. Um, or, I mean, a more creative way of looking at it is that he may be saying that why is it, you have to sort of listen deeply here, he may be saying in verse 21, why is it now that we have this influx of Gentiles into our movement? So what James may be saying is that, you know, it is this continuation of the practice of Judaism by those people who were Torah observant that is leading these Gentiles to want to join uh, the Jesus movement because we know that so many of the people that Paul was able to reach were the God-fearers who um, you know, were coming into the synagogues and listening to the Torah being read. So, it, it, again, I, I did a quite a bit of research into this verse 21. It's a bit of a quagmire. No one really seems to understand what James is saying here. It's quite loose and it's quite vague. Um, in terms of what he means. But I would just say, um, in terms of how I read Acts 15, what James is really advocating here is that they don't require a full conversion of Gentiles to uh, Torah Judaism by getting circumcised. He doesn't even mention circumcision here. He says all they need to do, right? It's, we're not going to impose that upon them. They just need to simply follow the Noahide laws. And I think what's important to, again, just be aware of is that the apostles being led here by James, and again, totally against whatever 
you know, speech that Peter allegedly made, the apostles seem to want to maintain the distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Um, you know, he he doesn't seem to accept what Peter had said. He doesn't seem to, uh, you know, accept this idea that you know we're all going to be uh, homogenized into one group. Um, it's only later, and Paul, by the way, himself, I mean, that's, that's what makes it so difficult to imagine that Peter said it. Paul himself doesn't express these ideas in this chapter. Right, Paul doesn't right. speak about one new man and the middle wall of partition being broken down and they're all one in the body of Jesus. He doesn't come out and say that he believes that now there's no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Paul is playing his cards close to his vest. And... Paul here doesn't say that uh, he believes that Jews no longer have to observe the Torah. Um, you know, for some strange reason, again, that's why I'm positive that those few verses that Peter allegedly says, he didn't say, because it's just so out of character, and in the next verses, James doesn't seem to have even heard it. Right, he has so, no response to it, hardly at all. He, he would have jumped all over his head. I right. mean, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> what, have you been, what have you been smoking? So... It seems that in this chapter, the apostles, um, they are traditionally Jewish in their perspective, and they do maintain this distinction between Jews and Gentiles. And basically, Jews have, an, have a path to God through observing the 613 commandments, and Gentiles, their path involves observing the seven commandments, the seven Noahide laws. Um, we know that in Paul's writings, which he hasn't expressed here, um, and again, because the writer of Acts is not interested in sharing the true picture of Paul. The writer of Acts is interested in sanitizing Paul. So, you know, you don't have the sentiments that Paul is going to express in his letters about the breakdown of distinctions between Jews and Gentiles and the idea that both Jews and Gentiles only need to believe in Jesus. Their salvation is through faith and the Gentiles become grafted into the Jewish people through faith. Um, you know, so but really, there are a few things that are going on here in Acts, but a few things that are going on behind the scenes which will not become uh, fully clear until we get to the letters of Paul. Um, okay. So, uh, basically, verse 22 is a recapitulation um, of what's happened so far. It's the Jerusalem decree. It pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Bar-Sabbas, Bar 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 and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And they wrote this letter by them, which is the following. It's a recapitulation. In verse 23, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the Torah, to whom we gave no such commandment. So again, this to me is an indication that, that James was not uh, in favor of having the Gentiles keep all the commandments. He's distinguishing here between, uh, you know, those people who wanted you to keep all the commandments and us. We're not uh, unsettling you with those with that sentiment. We're not saying that you must be circumcised and keep the law. So we didn't give any such commandment. James it says. James says, it seemed good to us. James says, being assembled with one accord. Now, that's a bit of a, a stretch. They weren't of one accord. There was, this is a lot of <laughs> rancor right, right, was over right. this discussion. So we wanted to send, with one accord, to send chosen men to you, our beloved Barnabas and Paul. And again, this is so much part of the agenda of Acts, you know, is to make it seem as if, you know, everybody's cozy, that, that Paul and the apostles, they're very lovey-dovey, they're very cozy, and again, it's trying to show the continuity between Paul and the group in Jerusalem, which would go back to Jesus. So it's really a way of connecting Jesus to Paul through the Jerusalem group led by James, the brother of Jesus. 
And if you can make everyone nice and lovey-dovey and one happy family, Paul now seems to be in line with Jesus and his movement. And again, the truth is that from the letters of Paul, we're going to see that the relationship was very rocky. So when they say here, our beloved Barnabas and Paul, that's a little bit of editorializing by Luke. So James is saying that we sent them men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord. We've therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Meaning that the only thing that you guys have to do, he doesn't, he doesn't hint here that this is just the starting point. You're going to have to do more down the road. It seems that this is the definitive ruling that for right, Gentiles, yeah. all you have to do are these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality, and if you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. And again, you know, part of the reason why there may not be a neat and clean correspondence between this list and the seven Noahide laws is because even within... Uh, rabbinic writings you know it, it, it wasn't so clear exactly what the seven laws were how they were defined and you know here there's a little bit also you know it is not an exact correspondence but I think that the gist of what James seems to be saying here is that he's presenting essentially the Noahide laws either explicitly or I would say they're sort of wrapped up in this list and um I think at this point, you know, Paul thinks that he's got it made in the shade because he's now being sent back, you know, with the approval of James. It seems as if now James is patting Paul on the back and saying, look, Paul, you know, you have your marching orders. You know, we've told you what you need to do. All you need to do is to impose the seven Noahide laws on the Gentiles, you know, and sort of the, and the assumption is that for, for Jews, though, Right, like you, Paul, and other Jews in the diaspora, you have obviously have to keep all the 613 commandments. And Paul, I believe, at this point, inside is sort of smiling, and he's saying, "Yeah, right. You know, when I'm gone, and I'm in the diaspora, and you're not going to be there, you know, breathing down my neck. I'm going to do what I want to do, which is again to teach the idea that it's only faith that saves you, not your works." and the commandments are no longer binding, and there's no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. I think Paul feels that, you know, he now has the license and the ability to pursue his own ideas, and sort of he feels that the Jerusalem group uh, is sort of giving him that license now, because they are sending him off, you know, being, he feels that they're sort of making him in charge. Um, and gotcha. uh, I think... You know what? That's really all I wanted to share on this chat. Well, well, good because we just get a phone call, uh, and as long as it's on topic, we'll we'll <laughs> we'll okay. take we'll take the call. Welcome to the show. Thanks for calling in. Tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hello, are you still there? Caller, can you hear us? Maybe they realize the show is over. <laughs> Tommy, Tommy, can you hear me? Yeah. There you go. Can you hear me now? You know, the Verizon guy has never been out to my house. Those people who know what Verizon is will know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, Rabbi, it has been just fascinating and just wonderful. Uh, I just got to say, uh, I, le <laughs> I learned a lot tonight. I actually really did because, uh, you know, for, for me up until tonight, uh, it, this, this whole chapter was a Grand Slam uh, messianic thing altogether that really just was one of the major messianic chapters that locked in their movement. Uh, but as we kind of worked our way through it, there's definitely holes through that. There's definitely holes in that altogether. Uh, well, I've seen many messianic commentaries that accept the idea that, you know, James was suggesting that the Gentiles observe the Noahide laws. Right. Um, wow. So it's not really uh, such a radical idea. Again, I'm willing to accept the idea that this chapter is far from clear. There's so many holes in it. I mean, Peter's speech is a real problem. Um, you know, what exactly does James mean? Mm -hmm. Because, again, it would have been much neater and cleaner if he actually spelled out the seven Noahide laws rather than sort of 
getting a few of them and hinting at a few of them. So it's not as neat and clean as uh, it, as it could have been, but it seems to me at least from the um, you know the, the the back and forth of what's happening, and especially the way James frames uh, his ruling, that you know that he really simply felt because it's what Judaism teaches, right? It's the, the yeah, Judaism right. teaches that non-Jews do not have to observe right. the laws of the Torah. Right. It's very clear. They can, have, they can have a relationship with God and have a share in the world to come simply by following the Noahide laws. And so James was ruling in the way a traditional Jew, Jew would rule right. and says, look, these Gentiles coming into the movement, if they just keep what they're supposed to keep, the Noahide laws, they don't need to feel that it's important to fully embrace the Torah, get circumcised, and convert fully, just not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I really get the impression that's what's going on. And I think the important thing for us as we, as we go through the rest of the books of the New Testament are going to be to see, number one, how in the book of Acts, you know, this is a far from a done deal, meaning that it looks like, you know, with this chapter, it's all peaceful now and everyone's you know, on the same page, and everyone's happy that, you know, Paul and Barnabas were schlepped back to Jerusalem to iron this out, and it seems at the end of this chapter that, okay, everything's cool, we're going to see very soon that, no, everything is not cool, mm -hmm. he's going to still be under a lot of heat, and he's going to come under a lot of fire, and, you know, and, and that's in a book that was written to make it seem as if everything was nice and hunky-dory. So even <laughs> with an agenda to That's have funny. in the book of Acts, you know, painting this one big happy family where Paul and James and Peter and John, they're all on the same page, they're all, you know, on the same team. It, despite that agenda, you still will see that there's tension between Paul and the group in Jerusalem. And then, again, when we get to the letters of Paul, we're going to see from the horse's mouth what he really is about and how you'll see that it's it's very obvious why mm -hmm. uh, there would be great tension between him and the, the group in Jerusalem because he's going to basically put his cards on the table and we're going to see that he would be a problem. Mm -hmm. he, he would be a problem. It's kind of like Donald Trump and Paul Ryan right now. In the <laughs> so, I don't want to go there. <laughs> Canadians are not allowed to make uh, <laughs> comments about American politics. <laughs> That's probably safe that way. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Rabbi. I had a great time. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Uh, check out Rabbi Skovac and all of his work. You can search for him. Choose for Judaism.ca on YouTube. Uh, Rabbi Michael Skovac. If you just Google that name, you'll find his stuff everywhere. Rabbi, shalom, shalom to you. And to everybody, Leith wrote, shalom, shalom. shalom. Thank you.